Hey Megan, good morning. It is uh, Saturday morning. I'm recording this and as you can see, it's a little bit snowy. My amaryllis is blooming. So just celebrating the small things. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I heard that you have done two treatments. So good for you. Probably the bravest person I know. Did you know that? Anyhow, on to chapter 15 of Hoot. Roy sat cross-legged on the floor, gazing up at the cowboy poster from the Livingston Rodeo. He wished he was as brave as the champion bull rider, but he wasn't. The Mother Paula's mission was simply too risky. Somebody or something should would be waiting. The attack dogs might be gone, but the company wasn't about to leave the new Pancake House location unguarded for long. In addition to a fear of getting caught, Roy had serious qualms about trying anything illegal. And there was no dodging the fact that vandalism was a crime, however noble the cause. Yet he couldn't stop thinking ahead to the day when the owl dens would be destroyed by bulldozers. He could picture the mother owls and father owls helplessly flying in circles while their babies were being smothered under tons of dirt. It made Roy sad and it made him angry. So what if Mother Paula's had all the proper permits? Just because something was legal didn't automatically make it right. Roy still hadn't settled the argument between his brain and his heart. Surely there had to be a way for him to help the birds and Beatrice's stepbrother without breaking the law. He needed to come up with a plan. Glancing out the window, Roy was reminded that time was slipping away. The shadows had lengthened, which meant that the sun would be setting soon and that mullet fingers would be on the move. Before leaving the house, Roy poked his head into the kitchen where his mother stood over the stove. Where are you going? She asked. Bike ride. Another one? You just got back. Hey, when's dinner? It smells great. Pot roast, honey. Nothing special. But we won't be eating until 7.30 or 8. Your dad had a late tea time. Tea, tea, like golf. Perfect, Roy said. Bye, Mom. What are you up to? She called after him. Roy? He pedaled at full speed to the block where Dana Matherson lived and chained his bicycle to a street sign. Approaching the house on foot, he slipped unnoticed through a hedge into the backyard. Roy wasn't tall enough to see in the windows. He had to jump and hold himself up by his fingers. In the first room, he saw a thin rumpled figure lying prone on a sofa. Dana's father, holding what appeared to be an ice pack to his forehead. In the second room was either Dana's mother or Dana himself, wearing red spandex pants and a ratty wig. Roy decided that it was probably Mrs. Matherson, since the person was pushing a vacuum cleaner. He lowered himself and resumed creeping along the outside wall until he reached a third window. And there, sure enough, was Dana. He lay sprawled on his bed, a lazy blob in dirty cargo pants and unlaced high-top sneakers. He wore a stereo headset and his head was jerking back and forth to music. Standing on tiptoe, Roy tapped his knuckles against the glass. Dana didn't hear him. Roy kept tapping until a dog on the porch next door began to bark. The next time Roy levered himself up to peek into the room, Dana was glowering at him through the window. He had pulled off the headset and was mouthing some words that even an amateur lip reader could have figured out. Smiling, Roy dropped to the lawn and took two steps back from the Matherson house. He proceeded to do something that was drastically out of character for a boy who was basically shy. What he did was salute crisply, spin around, drop his pants, and bend over. Viewed upside down, which was Roy, how Roy saw it, Dana's wide-eyed reaction suggested that he'd never been mooned in such a personal way. He seemed highly insulted. Calmly, Roy pulled up his trousers, then strolled around to the front of the house and waited for Dana to come hurtling out the door in a fury. And it didn't take long. Roy broke into a brisk jog with Dana no more than 20 yards behind him, cursing and spluttering vile names. Roy knew he was a faster runner, so he measured his pace. He didn't want Dana to get discouraged and give up. Yet, after only three blocks, it became evident that Dana was even worse shape than Roy had anticipated. Steadily, he ran out of steam, the angry curses dissolving into moans of fatigue, the name-calling sickly wheezes. When Roy checked behind him, he saw that Dana was gimping along in a lopsided half-trot. It was pathetic. 
They were still a half mile from where Roy wanted to be, but he knew Dana wouldn't make it without pausing for a rest. The sorry load was about to keel over. Roy had no choice but to pretend he was getting tired too. Slower and slower he ran, falling back in the chase until Dana was practically stumbling at his heels. Familiar, sweaty hands clamped on his neck. But Roy realized that Dana was just too worn out to throttle him. The kid was simply trying to keep himself from falling down. It didn't work. They landed in a heap. Roy pinned on the bottom. Dana was panting like a wet plow horse. Don't give, don't hurt me. I give up, Roy peeped convincingly. Ugh. Dana's face was as red as a pepper and eyeballs were fluttering in their sockets. You win, Roy cried. Ah! Dana's breath was foul, but his body odor was ferocious. Roy turned his head away to get some fresh air. Beneath them, the ground was soft and the soil was as black as coal. Roy guessed that they'd fallen in somebody's garden. They lay there for what seemed like forever while Dana recovered from the pursuit. Roy felt smushed and uncomfortable, but it was no use trying to squirm loose. Dana was dead weight. Eventually, he stirred tightened his hold on Roy and said, now I'm going to kick your butt, Everhart. Please don't do that. You mooned me. It was a joke. I'm really sorry. Hey, you moon somebody and that's it. You get your butt kicked. Well, I don't blame you for being mad, Roy said. Dana punched him in the ribs, but there wasn't a whole lot of muscle in the punch. You think it's funny now, cowgirl? Roy shook his head no, faking like it hurt. Dana grinned malevolently. His teeth were nubby and yellow like an old barn dog's. Leaning on Roy's chest, he hauled back to hit him again. Wait, Roy squeaked. For what? Beatrice the bear ain't here to save you this time. Siggies, Roy said in a confident whisper. Uh, Dana lowered his fist. What'd you say? I know where there's a whole case of cigarettes. If you promise not to beat me up, I'll show you. Well, what kind of cigarettes? Roy hadn't thought of that detail when he was cooking up a phony story. It hadn't occurred to him that Dana would be picky about his brand of smokes. Gladiators, said Roy, remembering the name from a magazine advertisement. Gold or light? Uh, gold? No way, Dana exclaimed. Way, Roy said. Dana's expression wasn't hard to read. He was already scheming to keep some of the cigarettes for himself and sell the rest for a tidy profit to his buddies. Where are they? He climbed off Roy and yanked him to a sitting position. Tell me. Well, first you gotta promise not to beat me up. Sure, sure, I promise. Ever again, for all time. Yeah, whatever. I wanna hear you say it. Dana laughed in a patronizing way. All right, little cowgirl. I'll never, ever, ever pound your sorry butt again. Okay, swear on my father's grave. That good enough for you? Well, your father's still alive, Roy pointed out. Well, then I swear on Natalie's grave. Now tell me where those gladiator golds are stashed. I ain't kidding. Who's Natalie? Roy asked. My mother's parakeet. It's the only dead thing I know. Well, I guess that'll do. Based on what Roy had seen of the Matherson household, he had an uneasy feeling that poor Natalie had not expired of natural causes. So, we cool? Dana asked. Yeah, said Roy. It was time to, time to turn the big dummy loose. The sun had dropped into the gulf. Streetlights were coming on. Roy said, there's an empty lot at the corner of Woodbury and East Oriole. Yeah? In one corner of the lot, there's a construction trailer. That's where the cigarettes are stashed. Sweet, a whole case, Dana said greedily. How come you know about it? Because me and my friends hid him there. We swiped him off a truck at the Seminole Reservation. You? Yeah, me. It was a fairly believable yarn, Roy thought. The Indian tribe sold tax-free tobacco products and smokers came from miles away to stock up. Well, what about's inside the trailer? Or whereabouts inside the trailer, Dana demanded. Oh, you can't miss him, Roy said. You want me to? I'll show you. Dana snorted. No, thanks. I'll find him. He placed two fingers in the center of Roy's chest and gave a stiff shove. Roy flopped back down on the flower bed, his head coming to rest in the same soft indentation. He waited a minute or so before getting up and brushing himself off. By then, Dana Matherson was long gone. 
Roy would have been disappointed if he wasn't. Curly made it through Friday night, though not without personal inconvenience. First thing Saturday morning, he drove to the hardware store and he bought a sturdy new seat for the toilet in the trailer, plus a dozen jumbo rat traps. Then he stopped at Blockbuster and got a movie in case TV, TV cable went out again. I guess this is before streaming. From there, he headed home where his wife informed him that she would need the pickup truck since her mother was taking the other car to the bingo hall. Curly didn't like anyone else driving his pickup, so he was sulking when his wife dropped him off at the trailer. Before settling down in front of the television, Curly took out his gun and made a quick tour of the property. Nothing appeared to have been disturbed, including the survey stakes. He began to believe that his presence indeed was keeping intruders away from the construction site. Tonight would be the true test. Without the pickup truck parked near the trailer, the place would appear deserted and inviting. As he walked the fence line, Curly was pleased not to come across a single cottonmouth moccasin. That meant he could save his five remaining bullets for serious security threats, though he didn't want a repeat of the nerve-rattling fiasco with the field mouse. Determined to discourage uninvited rodents, Curly carefully baited the rat traps with peanut butter and placed them at strategic locations along the outside walls of the trailer. Around five o'clock, he nuked a frozen dinner and popped the movie into the VCR. The turkey pot pie wasn't half bad and the cherry strudel turned out to be surprisingly tasty. Curly did not leave a crumb. Unfortunately, the movie was a disappointment it was called The Last House on Witch Boulevard 3, and one of the co-stars was none other than Kimberly Lou Dixon. A clerk at Blockbuster had helped Curly find the film, which had been released several years earlier before Kimberly Lou Dixon signed on for Mother Paula TV commercials. Curly guessed it was her very first Hollywood role before re after retiring from beauty pageants. In the movie, Kimberly Lou played a pretty college cheerleader who got hexed into a witch and started boiling the star football players in the basement cauldron. <laughs> Her hair was dyed fiery red for the part and she wore a fake nose with a rubber wart on the tip of it. The acting was pretty lame and the special effects cheesy. So Curly fast forwarded to the end of the tape. In the final scene, the hunk college quarterback escaped from the cauldron and threw some sort of magic dust on Kimberly Lou Dixon who turned from a witch back into a pretty cheerleader before collapsing in his arms. Then as the quarterback was about to kiss her, she morphed into a dead iguana. <laughs> Curly turned off the VCR in disgust. He decided that if he ever got to meet Kimberly Lou Dixon in person, he wouldn't mention the last house on which Boulevard three. He switched to cable and found a golf tournament, which made him drowsy. First prize was a million dollars in a new Buick, but Curly couldn't keep his eyes open. When he awoke, it was dark outside. A noise had startled him from his nap, but he wasn't sure what it was. And then he heard it again, snap. Instantly a cry rang out, possibly human, but Curly wasn't sure. He muted the TV and grabbed for his gun. Something, arm, fist, thumped against the aluminum side of the trailer. And then another snap, punctuated by profanity. Curly crept to the door and waited. His heart was thumping so hard, he was afraid the intruder might hear it. As soon as the doorknob began to jiggle, Curly went into action. He lowered a shoulder, let out a marine style roar and crashed out of the trailer, snapping the door off its hinges. The intruder let out a cry as he hit the ground in a heap. Curly pinned him there with a heavy boot on the midsection. Don't move. I won't, I won't. Curly lowered the gun barrel. By the light from the trailer, he could see the burglar was just a kid, kind of a large lumpy kid. He had accidentally stumbled upon the rat traps, two of which were attached crookedly to his sneakers. Ooh, that's gotta hurt, Curly thought. Don't shoot me, the kid cried. Ah, shut up. Curly stuck the 38 in his belt. What's your name, son? Roy, Roy Eberhardt. Well, you're in deep doo-doo, Roy. Sorry, please don't call the cops, okay? The boy began to wiggle. So Curly pressed down harder with his boot. Looking across the lot, he noticed that the padlock on the gate had been broken with a heavy chunk of cinder block. Hmm, you must have thought you were pretty slick, he said, sneaking in and out of here whenever you wanted, you and your smart ass sense of humor. The boy raised his head, 
what are you talking about? Don't play dumb, Roy. You're the one who yanked out all the survey stakes and you put those alligators in the porta potties. What? You're crazy. And you painted the cop car. No wonder you don't want me calling the police. Curly leaned in closer. What's your problem? You got a gripe with Mother Paula's? To be honest, you look like a kid that really does enjoy his pancakes. I do. I love pancakes. Well, what's the deal? Curly said. Why are you doing all this stuff? I never even been here before. Curly removed his foot from the kid's belly. Come on, kid, get up. The boy took his hand, but instead of letting Curly pull him to his feet, he yanked Curly to the ground. Curly managed to get one arm around the boy's neck, but he twisted free and hurled a handful of dirt into Curly's face. Just like in that stupid movie, Curly thought as he clawed miserably at his eyes, except I'm not turning into a cheerleader. He cleared the junk from his vision just in time to see the boy run off, rat traps clattering like castanets on the toes of his shoes. Curly attempted to give chase, but he only made it five steps before tripping in an owl hole and falling flat. I'll get you, Roy, he hollered in the darkness. You're out of luck, mister. Officer David Delenko had Saturday off, which was fine. It had been a hectic week, culminating in that weird scene in the emergency room. The missing dog bite victim still had not been found or identified though Officer Delinko now had a green shirt to match the torn sleeve he'd found on the fence at Mother Paula's. The boy who'd fled from the hospital must have left the shirt on the antenna of the squad car, like some kind of joke. Officer Delinko was tired of being the butt of jokes, though he was grateful for the fresh clue. It suggested that the emergency room runaway was one of Mother Paula's vandals, and that young Roy Eberhardt knew more than he was admitting. Officer Delinko figured that Roy's father would get to the bottom of the mystery, given his special background in interrogations. The policemen left the afternoon, spent the afternoon watching baseball on television, but both Florida teams got creamed. Devil Rays lost by five, Marlins by seven. Around dinner time, he opened his refrigerator and discovered there was nothing to eat but three individually wrapped slices of Kraft cheese. Indiv immediately, he embarked on a trip to the Mini Mart for a frozen pizza. As was his new routine, Officer Delinko made a detour toward Mother Paula's. He still hoped to catch the vandals, whoever they were, in the act. If that happened, the captain and sergeant would have little choice but to take him off desk duty and put him back on patrol with a glowing commendation in his file. Turning his squad car onto East Oriole, Officer Delinko wondered if the trained Rottweilers were, gather, were guarding the pancake house tonight. In that event, it would be pointless for him to stop. Nobody was going to mess with those crazy dogs. In the distance, a bulky figure appeared in the middle of the road. It was advancing in an odd gait. Officer Delinko braked his Crown Victoria and peered through the windshield. As the figure grew closer, passing through the glow of the streetlights, the policeman could see that it was a husky teenage boy. The boy kept his head down and seemed to be in a hurry, but he wasn't running normal. It was like a wobbly lurch, and each step made a sharp clacking sound. When the boy came into range, Officer Delinko noticed a flat rectangular object attached to each of his sneakers. Something strange was going on. The police officer flipped on the flashing blue lights and stepped out of the car. The surprised teenager halted and looked up. His pudgy chest was heaving and his face was slick with sweat. Officer Delinko said, can I talk for you, to you for a second, young man? Nope, answered the boy, turning to run. With rat traps on his feet, he didn't get far. Officer Delinko had no difficulty pat, uh, catching the boy and hustling him into the caged back seat of the cruiser. The patrolman's seldom used handcuffs worked splendidly. Why did you run? He asked. I want a lawyer, the kid replied, stone-faced. Hmm, cute. Officer Delinko put the squad car in a U-turn so he could take the boy to the police station. Glancing in the rearview mirror, he spotted another figure hurrying up the street, waving. Now what? thought the policeman, stepping on the brakes. Whoa, wait up! It was Leroy Brannett, a.k.a. Curly, the foreman of Mother Paula's project. He was huffing and puffing. His face was florid and smudged with dirt. Ah, <sighs> you caught him, the foreman exclaimed breathlessly. Way to go! Who'd I catch? Him, the little sneak who's been messing up our place. He tried to bust into my trailer tonight. Lucky I didn't shoot his fool head off. Officer Delinko fought to con contain his excitement. He'd done it. He'd caught the mother Paula's vandal. 
I had him pinned and he got away, Curly said. Not before I wrung his name out of him. It's Roy. Roy Eberhardt. You go ahead and ask him. Well, I don't need to, said Officer Jelenko. I know Roy Eberhardt and that's not him. What? Curly was fuming. Officer Jelenko said, I assume you watch press charges? You bet your shiny tin badge I do. This creep tried to blind me too. He threw dirt in my eyes. Oh. Well, that's assault, said Officer Delenko, to go along with attempted burglary, trespassing, destruction of private property, and so forth. Don't worry, I'll put it all in the report. He mentioned a uh, motion to the passenger side and told Curly to hop in. You'll need to come to headquarters. My pleasure. Curly scowled at the sullen lump in the back seat. You want to hear how he got those ridiculous rat traps on his tootsies? Uh, later, said Officer Delenko. I want to hear everything. This was the big break that the policeman had been waiting for. He could hardly wait to get to the station and pry a full confession out of the teenager. From training films, Officer Jelenko remembered that delicate psychology was necessary when dealing with uncooperative suspects. So in a deliberately mild voice, he said, you know, young man, you can make this much easier on yourself. Yeah, right, the kid muttered. You could start by telling us your real name. Mm, gee, I forget. Curly chuckled harshly. Putting this one in jail is going to be fun. Officer Delinko shrugged, said, have it your way. You got nothing to say? That's cool. You're entitled under the law. The boy smiled crookedly. What if I got a question? Go ahead and ask it. Okay, I will, said Dana Matherson. Either you got a cigarette I could have. That's the end. <laughs>